presentation this evening will be offered by Howard McFarland, Senior Bishop, UNCCI Church. Mr. McFarland here? No? Okay. Councilman Robertson, I'm, can I call on you to offer our, our invocation? If you would please stand and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Shall we pray? Eternal Lord, we are so very grateful for this opportunity to share together as a city council here in Independence. We recognize you, Lord, as the giver of life and the, li and the giver of everything good. And we pray now that your good spirit will grace us this evening, that it will bless our discussions that it will bless the city with the decisions that are made. Watch over us now and keep us in your care as we trust in you for all things. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam State Clerk, will you please call the roll? Council Members Huff? Here. Perkins? Here. Doherty? Here. DeLucy? Here. Robertson? Here. Van Camp? Here. Mayor Weir? Here. Um, our first order of business is a presentation resolution recognizing Robert Ellers, Engineering Technician 3 in the Public Works Department as the Employee of the Month for November 2018. Madam State Clerk. Whereas the City Employee Recognition Program recognizes outstanding performance by employees of the City of Independence, and whereas an employee committee selects the employee of the month for exhibiting the qualities and ideals that best represent public service, and whereas the employee recognition committee has selected Robert Ellers, Engineering Technician 3 in the Public Works Department as employee of the month for November 2018. Now therefore be it resolved by the Council of the City of Independence, Missouri as follows. The City Council of the City of Independence, Missouri joins in recognizing Robert Ellers as City of Independence Employee of the Month for November 2018. I'd entertain a motion for approval. So, so moved. Move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Abstain. Which is, oh, this is a minute? Okay, <laughs> go ahead. No, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> DeLucy? Yes. Here. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. <laughs> wow. Oh, that was almost historic. <laughs> um, Robert Allers has been with the City of Independence for 16 years, currently as an engineering tech three in the Public Works Department, and has also worked in the Parks Department. Robert says what he likes most about his job is interacting with the public, his coworkers, and the various responsibilities the job brings. Utility billing, inspecting right-of-way construction, solving disputes, and inputting permits. Robert says he started as a light equipment operator for about 13 years, and in the last three years has received three promotions. His goals are to keep pushing himself forward and never settle. The most valuable lesson Robert says he has learned in his career is to answer the door when you hear the knock and believe in yourself and your inner strength. Robert says a typical day on the job for him is to check emails and voicemails in the morning, input right away permits, field inspections, handle a few high pro profile situations, and have scheduled office time in the afternoon for the, counter, for the counter, more emails and permits. Outside of work, Robert enjoys camping, hiking, and fishing. Robert says he thinks the mix of history and modernism makes independence a good place to live, work, and visit. Please join me in recognizing Robert Ellers as a November 2018 Employee of the Month. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one proclamation this evening for World War I Remembrance. Whereas a century ago, 4.7 million American families sent their sons and daughters off to World War, and whereas the resources of our entire nation were brought to bear on the war effort, and whereas 116,516 Americans gave their lives in the war, and more than 200,000 were wounded, 
And whereas in November 2018, the world will commemorate the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended the fighting in World War I at 11 a.m. November 11th, 1918, the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. Now therefore, Eileen N. Weir, Mayor of the City of Independence, Missouri, by the virtue of the authority vested in her, calls upon all citizens of Independence to pause at 11 a.m. on November 11th, 2018 and recognize, commemorate, and give thanks for the service and sacrifice of those who served in World War I. Thank you very much. Uh, this takes us to our consent agenda. Madam Mayor. Yes. Before we move to the consent agenda, I ask that we suspend the council rules to allow uh, citizens to speak before certain votes on AMI in particular. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules of order um, to allow citizens. We have one citizen who has signed up to speak regarding bill number 18807. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Um, let me um, ask for a motion for approval for the consent agenda, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, <laughs> Mayor Weir, I move to approve the reports and recommendations of the city manager. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any items any council member wishes pulled into consideration? Madam Mayor? Yes, Council Member DeLucy. Item number two. Item 18806. Do you want to pull 807? Mayor. 18807. 18807, okay. And I'm going to pull 18804. Are there any others? Okay. Madam City Clerk, will you please call the roll on the consent agenda minus item number two? Uh, resolution 18806, resolution 18807, and resolution 18804. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Um, Council member DeLucy, I'll start with um, item number two. Yes, Madam Mayor. I noticed item number two. Uh, first off, purchasing rejected the item. The other city departments accepted the item, so I'd like to know what the problem was with purchasing. I also have questions regarding who decides which company gets which job. It's very unclear from this item. Uh, Councilwoman, the first question about rejecting, uh, unfortunately that's a technicality with our system where it tracks, so if a user has gone in wants to make a change, but it's already moved past their department, they'll ask a department to reject it and send it back to them. So that was a product of, unfortunately it tracks that on there. Um, we've been working with the clerk on, you know, trying to find a new system or a different way to look at that, but there's some inside base. It has nothing to do with their evaluation of the, of the uh, purchase order here. Okay. Um, to your question about how that is um, vetted out, um, it's typically a product of availability. Um, so what we're doing here is certifying a number of vendors who are able to do that. And then um, on short notice, we would call and ask for them to come and make these repairs or enhancements or whatever. And it's a matter of scheduling and availability at the um, department's discretion. And so it's not like they take turns? No, it's, it's really a matter of um, uh, who's available that particular day, who can get somebody out there to take care of the work. Now, there may be an element of equity in there to try to see, you know, who, who did we call last or something like that. But really, it's, it's the department's discretion, and ultimately, it's going to be the department director who's responsible for that uh, decision. But, but there is no um, built-in equity mechanism or anything like that. It's typically who can get the job done in a pinch. So if I'm in IPL and I like Mark 1, for example, I can just pick Mark 1 and there's no oversight on that? There's oversight from the department director, from procurement, all that, but um, it, it's going to, like I said, again, it's going to be a product of, of who can get out there to do the work um, that particular day. What, what we're really certifying here are quick turnaround uh, repair type works or enhancements for the department. Um, I would tell you that most of our departments are going to probably try to work off of an equity basis or an awareness basis, though, and see, you know, 
what kind of calls, things like that we've gotten. But yeah, it, it's a matter of discretion at the department level. Oh, sorry. Okay, and final question. Mm -hmm. I'm IPL, I pick Mark 1, Water pick somebody else, mm -hmm. Public Works pick somebody else. Who's the overseer that decides equity has been accomplished? Primarily, this one is going to be utilized by Independence Power and Light, so we're not going too multi-departmental there, so I don't think that complication is going to exist at the level that you're inquiring about right here. Is it a problem? See, I lied. Uh -huh. I had one more question. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Is it a problem for us to have a report in six months to see how the contracts have been distributed? No, that would be very easy to pull for you um, okay. and, and pull down for you and show you how that's been um, divided up. Thank you. Sure. Madam Mayor, I move approval of item number two. Second. So I moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Abstain. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Item number two passes. Um, Council member DeLucy, 18806. I'd like to know how this got on the agenda and who decided that six or seven staff people and three or four council people would make up this committee? Certainly, so uh, following the um, council's adoption of the downtown redevelopment coordinating committee's final report, um, really the trap that we've fallen in in the past, councilwoman, is a lack of um, staffing, lack of resources to manage those plans into action. We've, we've been very good in the past about planning, but not so much on the implementation side. So. One of the committee's recommendation was to, and, and the consultant CFS that we worked with, was to form this working group to make sure that we had the expertise uh, necessary to lend to the projects outlined by the committee, but also to mandate at least a regular reporting schedule, uh, meeting schedule. So similar to the audit and finance committee that I know you chair, that we are required to meet at least quarterly, more frequently if we need. This group's going to be required to meet monthly. The purpose of that really, again, is to make sure that we stay diligent and attentive and don't fall into the traps we have of the past of inaction or becoming consumed with the next project, the next planning initiative, something like that. Um, this was really um, my discretion about what I thought was the right mix of people, um, um, and actually I should say the right personnel because people change, but the positions that are essential, I believe, to the early success of these projects, um, and I believe it was at a I don't know if it was a council meeting or a study session recently, but I the study session last week. Last week, where I asked uh, if council could um, lend some support to this as well, too, and um, I think a couple council members volunteered to be a part of that at that meeting. I was one, correct. Correct. What's the budget? Uh, right now, we don't have a dedicated budget for that. This is going to be more. The, the early days of this committee are going to be identifying where some of the um, early synergies and early wins in that report will be. Um, collaborating with um, uh, the business and civic community, the council and our staff trying to identify where we want to lend some of our will and support uh, so it doesn't require a budget right now. What it may require is us to decide what those resources are going to need to be to uh, make those projects successful um, in the short and long term. And so I noticed that they would um, hire consultants as necessary. Where's the money coming from, and is it going to come to us, or is it not going to come to us? How yeah, so we'll work? need to come to the. I mean, if we're, um, you know, our my spending authority is limited to fifty thousand dollars. So, and of course, what's available in the budget, we would need to come back to the council and work with you on an as-needed basis to allocate resources for that, identifying that through the budget process, et cetera. I don't foresee us needing a, a tremendous amount of consultant support at this point. This needs to be more about identifying strategizing and planning which of these projects we're going to begin to initiate and move forward um, and that that's free to do that that's just using our gray matter and thinking about where we want to start to s accelerate this plan into action one thing that bothered me was section 3 it says no more than three council members may attend a meeting to meet the requirements of the Missouri Sunshine Law that is not correct as long as we advertise this as a public meeting more than three council people may attend and I am not named in this, but I would like to attend these meetings. Okay, I... So can you correct section three? 
that may require a act of the council right here to amend the resolution. Then I move to amend this resolution and delete section three, the last sentence, no more than three council members may attend a meeting to meet the requirements of the Missouri Sunshine Law. I would make the amendment without that being posted as a public meeting. There are council members who are assigned to this committee. Um, there will be no votes taken um, on this committee, so that was, um, we worked with the city clerk on that language. Any council members entitled to attend any meeting that they wish to, um, but if there's more than three council members there, we will need to post that as a public meeting. And I'm going to attend is what I'm saying. So there will be more than three. Therefore, I would like to delete that sentence. Madam Mayor. Yes. There is a, there is a motion. Mm. Is there a second? A second. OK. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Walker, should we just make it a standard practice to go ahead and post this publicly for all uh, for our attendees just to um, squelch any, any concerns? Um, you know, I don't. I think what's more important to me is the work of the committee. Right. I'm, I'm not too worried about the composition of that, so I'll, right. uh, I, I wouldn't have any objection to that. Very nice. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Is there any other discussion? Um, we have a motion to amend. Yes. Amend the motion. Read the motion again, Councilor Clerk. Uh, the motion on the floor is to delete the last sentence of section three, which is no more than three council members may attend a meeting to meet the requirements of the Missouri Sunshine Law. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes. If I might add, just to, to help with the clarifications uh, with my colleague, uh, as we discussed this at the last study session, this is just a committee to keep things moving, things moving forward. Had a meeting with our Fairmont group um, about three weeks ago. We're not standing still with the Downtown Redevelopment Coordinating Committee recommendations. We're moving forward. There's a lot of enthusiasm in Inglewood and also in Fairmont keep things moving with with this committee this will help keep us on track and moving forward so with that I would appreciate your support okay I, I'm comfortable with removing that sentence if it you know causes confusion of course every, any council members welcome to attend any meeting um, of um, but I think it is important that we have um, assigned representatives from this council who are responsible for um, participating in these meetings and working together with our staff and if we choose to use outside consultants to make that um, make sure that this that these goals are accomplished this ma'am it is on the agenda is 18806 we can read the heading of the agenda item madam state clerk Bill number 18-806, a resolution creating the Independence Honor Roll Working Group Committee. Okay. There's, um, if there's no further discussion, we please call the roll on the motion. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Motion passes. Council Member DeLucy? I move approval of uh, 18806. Second. I moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Member Seth? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Uh, resolution passes. Um, I will, before we move on to 18807, I would um, ask Lucy Young to come forward, who had requested a speech to the council regarding bill number 18807. Thank you. I have a few questions about Bill 18807. How much are these smart meters going to cost us in the long term? Even if the federal government grant pays for the standard 50%, what is our cost of service? How much does it affect our rates already the highest in the metro? I took the limited information available to citizens and calculated what I foresee as the future cost of spending. At the August 13, 2018 AMI vendor study session, Honeywell stated that their numbers were for a three-year price. Tonight's amount has a document, their documented 10-year installation and software hosting. This is what they proposed. The 24,000 is for 10 years. The 17,000 is for three years. If you subtract it, you find the difference is seven and a half million dollars. If you take seven and a half million dollars 
and divide it by seven years, the difference between the three and the 10 years, you'll see annually we are gonna be charged over a million dollars for their services. If you take that, which is the price that they wanted tonight, and divide it over the 10 years, you've got what the actual cost is that's coming out of the IPL budget if we do not get the federal uh, assistance. Excuse me, let me catch up here. Uh, we don't have how much it'll be for the perpetual cost. We don't ha it doesn't include the warranty information for battery replacement it, if they're out of warranty. It doesn't talk about product upgrade cost as technology improves and other associated cost. So if we uh, reduce the IPL budget to save $2 million, we're actually not saving $2 million because as I've shown you, it's costing us $2 million. So we're actually costing us more money to put these AMIs in without federal assistance. You can half that if it, they put in 50%. Previous council meetings, uh, the truth shows that it's only actually a $900,000 savings. Now, I realize that's a lot of money, $900,000, but it didn't matter when there was a Missouri City budget. That was $5 million over. It was, it was stated on India Energy's website and the examiner that no one would lose their job. I want to know will these employees that would either be forced to retire or transferred to another job would they keep the same rate of pay as what they earn at IPL? Or would those be factored into our cost of service and our IPL rates as well? A former PUAB meeting, Mr. Day asked, what are the benefits to IPL and the IPL rate payers? According to the Electric Power Research Institute, known as EPRI, the smart grid test underwhelms. Less than 9% powered down their peak usage and the overall reduction was statistically insignificant. Truth is that the benefit of the M, uh, M, excuse me, at the smart meters goes to the power company to stop the utility theft and increase revenues with more accurate meter readings. KCPNL recently had a reduction in rates, but if you looked at the fine words on that document, it was a one-time payment and the residential customer got a 0.339% reduction. Kansas Utility Ratepayer Board, known as CURB, is the reason that they got that reduction. We have essentially the same committee here, our PUAB department, I mean, excuse me, board members, but they don't have the same authority. CURB had to take the utilities to what essentially ended up to be a utility court and you are the governing body, and you would be that court. You have the, I wish the PUAB had the authority to challenge and override you. One minute, Ms. Young. This council has ignored their advice not to loan water to the water department funds to build the farmer's market, spent $5 million more with Missouri City, purchased electric cars without charging stations from a company when you, if you'd have bought them outright, you could have saved $70,000. The cost of the streetlights has, has shifted from the general fund to the ratepayers' backs. Now you ignore the PUAB's recommendation based on IPL staff advice and want Honeywell. A government should be open and above board. The PUAB actually recommended point to point four times. First time was taken out in April, three times this year alone. PUAB is trying to run IPL as the charter states, as a business for the ratepayers, and not as a funding source for political failures. Thank you. Council Member, <laughs> Council Member Robertson, 18807. 18807, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to move to amend this resolution uh, from mesh to point to point AMI system. If, first of all, if I get a second, I'd like to, to speak to it. Second. I moved and seconded. It may, I'm going to, before we move on to discussion, I just want to clarify, Mr. City Manager, what this resolution is, um, is directing. 
We do have a negotiated proposal from the, a provider from a point-to-point -point system. This uh, council and the PUAB had a joint meeting to hear from the, all of the vendors and get a greater understanding of the options for implementing this system if we move forward. So um, this resolution, and I'm going to let you explain to it, is simply uh, give, providing direction to um, explore the mesh system and then the council will make their choice. Is that correct? Yeah, um, well said, Mayor. The original, uh, you know, this has been a three-year journey and the original evaluation by staff um, led to a recommendation for the sole point-to-point -point provider, which was core in Maine. Um, so we went through the t traditional RFP <laughs> process and, and that brought the recommendation forward. Back on April 16th of this year, council made the determination at that point in time not to move forward with uh, at the project. Um, uh, brought that back up uh, this past summer, late this summer, early this fall. Um, as you mentioned, we had the vendors come in, uh, five of them to be exact. Again, one was point to point, the other four were mesh. Um, what this resolution would do was express the council's uh, preference for a mesh vendor over the point to point. Uh, at their most recent meeting, the PUAB uh, um, did affirm their original recommendation for the point to point, but they did say that if the council were to move forward with the mesh and their recommendation would be for Honeywell. So this resolution is really written to reflect that conversation. Um, we do not have a negotiated contract yet with Honeywell because of the, what I told you, the original recommendation. Um, this would give us the direction to go and put that together, which would still then need to come back to council for the traditional two readings and final consideration. Thank you. Councilman? So, so my amendment is to amend the motion to go ahead with the contract we already have uh, negotiated with um, Core and Maine for the point-to-point -point system. So this would speed up the process and save us um, the effort as well as the cost of negotiating another contract. Um, we've already worked through this. We've already talked about this a lot. So I don't think, I don't think going back and going to point-to-point -point later is going to make any difference. And it's it's a question now of whether we want to go to mesh or to point to point. So the RFP process by the city staff was probably the most thorough we have ever had on any uh, agenda item before the city council. They compared Honeywell and Corn Maine with over a thousand points of comparison, over a thousand. Um, and they came to the conclusion that they recommended the point to point system. Uh, it came out better than Honeywell, and it was less cost, and it was recommended by the staff. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I had put in each of uh, the council's boxes a uh, paper that I had written about comparing mesh to point to point, and I actually had it fact checked with IPL. And so you'll see in that document some highlighted portions, and those were the comments made by IPL staff. So I'd like to just go through that briefly with you, and then I want to comment on the letter that I got this week from Corin, Maine. So in comparing AMI mesh to point to point, first of all, mesh, I believe that there are security issues with the mesh system. It's on a public frequency, but it is encrypted. So mesh is transmitted on an intranet, house-to-house, -house, node to node collector, and then on to the city system. <clears throat> there are many more transmissions and points of transmission for increased risk of interception and public on a public frequency. This means more risk of error, more information is needed to identify the exact meter. The staff added this comment, the average mesh meter transmits about 14.55 minutes per day. Point to point transmits 0.7 seconds per day. Mesh transmits hundreds of times per day, point to point four to six times per day. Mesh requires meters to hop from one to another to reach a base station. Now RF, mesh uses a weaker RF signal, so it is not as strong but the mesh system is constantly on, just like the router in your house. Constantly sending and receiving signals to confirm the network, confirm that it's in, in touch with the network, even when it's not needed to transmit data. 
This signal is aimed at collector houses or businesses that transmit on the data, making some places much higher in RF exposure. Radio frequency, or RF, is a form of radiation and like all radiation is accumulative. That means that the amount of radiation is equal to the strength of RF multiplied times the amount of time of exposure. My estimate is that the radiation for mesh is between 100 times and 1,000 times more radiation exposure than point to point. The, uh, the staff's comment was point to point produces 254 milliwatt minutes of exposure per month. 254 ex uh, milliwatt minutes per month. Mesh it exposes 109,014 milliwatt minutes per month. Both are still within the FCC limit of exposure and considered safe per the city's Board of Health report. With either system, we will be tied to one company from then on. It won't, it won't be possible to change from mesh to point to point or from point to point to mesh. Access will be to their software upgrades, to their hardware replacements, and to their maintenance. <clears throat> how good they continue to update in the future and how stable the company is going to be a gamble. How close is the supply of replacement meters? Mesh will require an estimated 394 devices, including transmitters, collectors, and repeaters. 394. Maintenance of nodes, setting up of a complicated intranet system within the city is much more expensive and time consuming and will require much more in maintenance costs. And such a network will, will require more manpower and time increasing the cost to the city. Point to point on security. So the point to point system is to be set up on a private frequency owned and licensed from the FCC. It also is encrypted, but it's aimed at transmitted to transmitter towers, not at homes or businesses. Less information is required due to each meter transmitting directly and transmitting less, like I said, than two seconds per day. The city uh, staff has added this comment. Mesh utilizes a 900 megahertz network, and, and you'll recognize 900 megahertz, it's on some of the portable phones that you carry around your house. It's an unlicensed public frequency used for many purposes, including amateur radios, vehicle sensors, cordless phones, and walkie-talkies, etc. There are no issues at this time with interference using this spectrum, but other technologies could potentially encroach on this spectrum in the future. Point to point, the point-to-point -point option is to purchase a private spectrum from FCC for exclusive use within our geographic area. I've already mentioned the RF. Um, again, with point to point, we would be tied to that company for their meters and software upgrades. Access to the meters from our point to point system would have an inventory located just a few miles away in eastern Jackson County. Point to point would only require 20 towers for transmission collection needed most of which would be located on city property. Maintenance of these required limited, would require limited cost and manpower and will not require the city to upgrade and maintain a citywide intranet network. I received this, this letter. Councilman, may I interrupt you for one moment before sure. you read the letter? Um, I just want to, it to be known um, I also received a letter from Corin Maine. I presume every council member may have. I received a, t um, a couple of telephone, a number of telephone calls. I did not read the letter. I did not return the telephone calls. I passed those along to our city manager because I did not want to put myself in a position of conflict of interest of communicating directly with a vendor or bidder on a city project. <coughs> you can proceed. So a couple of the points that they made in their letter, I'm not going to read the whole letter, but one of, one of the points that they made was the, the water endpoint radio warranty has 24, or a 20 year warranty, has a 20 year warranty with 15 years at a full 100% replacement. 
and an additional five years of prorated replacement. The battery life in their meters is 20 years expected battery life. The other point that they made, which I found interesting, was that the point-to-point -point versus um, the mesh uh, in includes a coverage of these meters, of the, of the area of independence. And their concern was that, that the competition, the mesh system, may have difficulty reading water meters that are, are far away outside of independence with no electric meters to hop to. Usually the water meter will hop the signal to the electric meter because a lot of the water meters are located in a pit in the ground. Um, I've been told that we have 3,500 water meters outside the city of independence. And so there's going to be a problem, and it's going to be a real concern as to how we set up a mesh system, if we do that, outside the city of Independence that can actually communicate um, back to the city and send that signal completely. It's going to be, it's going to be hopped all the way back from, from miles and miles outside the city of Independence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is a motion and a second to amend the resolution. Is there any discussion? Uh, yes. If I might, yes. uh, your, your, your motion is to not do mesh. Right. Okay. And to go ahead with a contract we already have, have negotiated. Well, you bring up some excellent points. I'm, I'm not, what, although that this has all been uh, vetted, several times, as you had mentioned, you know, and everything. But you're not asking for any time, additional time to say which is which, given your opinion on which is one good and one is bad. I mean, one, it, one it, is better and one is not as good. In your opinion, I, as, as in the opinion of what our staff came forward with, but you want a decision made on either or rather than to look at it some more? I don't, I think we've looked at it long enough. Can I answer that, Mayor? Is that yes, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> um, we've looked at this for a year and a half. Um, and, and this is what was brought we, forth we, to, the, to, the, to the council. It right. wasn't mesh that was brought forth. Right. Yeah. Is there any other discussion? Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman. This is a very big topic that we have to look at and take all information under diligent advisement. So uh, my question for the uh, councilman, and I too, Mayor, um, I don't recall seeing the letter, but I did uh, answer a phone call from Cormain last Saturday as it popped up on my phone from a Blue Springs number. Um, so my question for council, was there any discussion or correspondence between you and Cormain? Was there any discussion? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear was you. Was there any discussion with between yourself or court discussion or correspondence between yourself and Corn Maine? This letter's the first I've ever gotten from him. Okay. No discussion. No discussion. Fair enough. Um, Madam State Clerk, will you, I just want to be clear on I, the motion. Uh, I think what I think the motion is <laughs> is that Councilman Robertson is asking uh, to direct the city manager to bring forth an ordinance with the point-to-point, -point, and that's Corn Maine. Correct. At the next council meeting is what Since I'm we hearing. Already have a okay, because councilman, what I understood your motion was was to replace. Um, I'm sorry. Honeywell. Negotiate a contract um, with point-to-point um, -point system rather than with the mesh system provider. Is that correct? No. I not, mean, okay. Not quite. Then I misunderstood. I've, since we already have a contract negotiated okay. with Corn Maine, I'm asking for that contract to be brought forward in the form of an ordinance so that we can go ahead and okay. vote. Okay, very good. Okay, so what this, what the existing uh, resolution is, is to negotiate a contract with Honeywell, which is the highest rated mesh provider, um, to further answer some of the questions that were raised tonight by the citizens and give the the council the opportunity for a more complete side-by-side -side comparisons before we make this decision whether to proceed, whether not to proceed, and which provider, which system we, the council prefers, correct? That's correct. 
All right, I, I can go right ahead. May I be more specific? Yeah. And that, that would include an opt out. But that's in that's in your yeah. your yeah. plan as well. Okay. Yeah, Councilman. Yeah, we're not deciding to do this no. at this time. Correct. No, uh, Council Member, this would be if if the this would be affirming the council's preference for the mesh technology and the highest rated of the mesh providers, which was Honeywell, and directing us to go negotiate a contract with that provider. Then that would come back to council for final consideration of whether or not to complete the project whether or not to put in smart meters. Correct. Okay, so it, it, it's still. <laughs> so what Councilman Robertson is asking for is cease all negotiations with everybody else and bring forward the um, ordinance to award the contract to Corn Maine, I presume at the next so council this, meeting. So this would solidify the uh, smart meters? No. No, it would not. Let me let me be clear. Under his, we would still have to vote on. It still would still, it would still have. Essentially, what we would, if, if Councilmember Robertson's amended motion were to pass and the resolution were to pass as amended, what we would essentially be bringing back is the ordinance that was defeated by the council on April the 16th. The only change would be is that when we went back this summer, um, we asked for best and finals from all of them, and and Corn and Mains came down. A fraction so the, the the number might look a little different other than that it would be the exact same ordinance it's already been before you before and we voted it down last time. at that time yes is there any further discussion on the motion <clears throat> madam mayor yes. I am totally against both of these um, I think that uh, these are wants and not needs um, you know we got a power plant out there to worry about we're spending 24 million dollars Plus, um, we better start worrying about that generation out there instead of spending all something. I don't think the public really cares whether a computer's reading their meter or a person. And to throw this money out there, I think it's ridiculous. Um, I think we need to concentrate on that generation down there rather than this. And rate, and rate reduction. Sorry. me uh -huh. I do do to think the first priority is the powerhouse and generation and capacity uh, whether or not uh, this seems to be uh, smart meters come to be because uh, I, I was voted against before and I will again uh, but it may be the future and, and uh, I don't think that, I think this is jumping the gun here, and I, I would appreciate even more time, but uh, if that's your resolution. Okay. Is there any further discussion? I just want to know what we're voting on. Okay. <laughs> Madam St. Clark. Uh, we're voting on uh, the amendment to the resolution, as Councilman Robertson stated, that he wants the city manager to negotiate a contract with Corn Maine for point to point and bring forth an ordinance to council at the next meeting or as soon as possible. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. There's no further discussion. Please call the roll. Council members Huff? No. Perkins? Bain. Doherty? No. DeLucy? No. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? No. Mayor Weir? No. Motion fails. Councilman I think it's important to realize that that the automatic metering is it's all around us right now okay so every city around us has it because KCPNL has it in all their jurisdictions um, in the long run it is going to save the city a considerable amount of money and perhaps will lower um, the electric rates or at least the need in the future to raise the electric rates. So I'm, I'm gonna make one more motion, Mayor. Um, I would move that we substitute for 18.807 a motion to put it on the ballot as either mesh or point to point and allow our citizens to vote and to make the decision 
Um, it would include an opt-out for either one, and we would put it on the April ballot. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Um, I, I still think that we are missing the point of this resolution this evening. This res we have, as Councilman Robertson said, spent a considerable amount of time evaluating this, um, and we know a lot about the point-to-point -point in our evaluation. We don't know as much about the option for mesh. So I um, am going to vote against that motion once again because I think the, motion, the resolution that is in front of us is simply directing the city manager to go find out more about the mesh um, option so that we or the community, if that's what we choose to do, can make the most informed decision. Any other discussion? In my opinion, this has been the most studied issue before the city that I can ever remember. We've had all five vendors here. We've had a chance to ask questions. I've studied it. There's, there's nothing else I need to know about MESH, and this, this original um, resolution asks us to negotiate a contract, which in my opinion is just the beginning of going ahead and uh, passing an ordinance to go to MESH, to a MESH system. So I don't think that there's any reason to put off the decision I between. disagree, and the, the citizen who spoke this evening asked a lot of questions regarding Honeywell and the cost that we don't have the answers for because we have not had the opportunity to go and negotiate that option. So I, again, um, believe that whatever decision we end up making, whether it's to do this, not to do it, who to use, whether this council is going to make this decision, whether the voters make this decision, we owe it to our citizens to provide as much information as we can, and this resolution is simply directing the city manager to go find that information for us so that we can make the most informed decision. Uh, Madam Mayor? Yes. I, it, this is an information resolution to go to go find out it's a negotiated contract what we already it, have I, one negotiated contract with point to point this would give us a second negotiated contract so, with with the mesh and see how they stack up is that correct mr city manager we would we would at that juncture if this resolution passed uh, as originally written would have a negotiated contract with honeywell for council consideration as we do with core as you do presently we have a negotiated contract with core and main correct so let me get this if i may uh councilman Roberts. you want to put the decision whether or not to be mash or point to point on a ballot correct let's let the citizens decide well why wouldn't we let the citizens decide whether they want ami or not <laughs> i mean this sort of puts them in a bind to saying which evil do you want a rock and a hard place that allows them to opt out to either one. Oh, the opt out is by far I, I would assume everybody on the council would uh recommend uh that an opt out uh, there would not if this was implemented which it well may be i i'm voted again but the, the, what i'm saying is this may become the technology that, that that we have to go forward with but i don't think you should put the citizenship in a bind of saying I have Vendor. to take this or that. I mean, if you want to do it, let's just let them vote on AMI altogether. We can amend the motion and put on there to vote no for AMI. Point to point mesh or no? <laughs> <laughs> Is there any discussion on the motion? Madam City Clerk, will you please read the motion? I have the motion to call for an election in April of 2019 uh, to give the citizens a choice on AMI point to point or AMI mesh. With an opt out. With an opt out. Please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? No. 
Doherty? No. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? No. Mayor Weir? No. Motion fails. Councilman Robertson? I move uh, bill number 18807. I have a question. It needs a second. Second. Yes, Councilmember DeLucy. Mr. City Manager, is there a reason we're only negotiating with uh, Honeywell? Because um, there's three other vendors that were also mesh, and none of them, I mean, is there a reason we're not going with, why, why don't we just negotiate with all three of them to right. get the best price? Right, well, that's, that's your, we already know their pricing on it, what we'd be negotiating here, or as the mayor said, some of the questions that was asked by the citizen tonight, those are provocative questions that would be negotiated out in a contract, warranties, switch outs, uh, all those kind of things like that, that we, those are the terms and conditions we haven't gotten into. Um, typical procurement process, whether it's overlaying a street, fixing a park, anything like that. We go out, we solicit bids, we negotiate a contract with the one that has emerged as the staff recommendation, we put it on your agenda for a council. We don't negotiate a contract with each and every vendor. We negotiate with the one that has emerged through the procurement process that, that will become the staff recommendation. If that recommendation is rejected by the council or substituted out, then we have to go and negotiate a contract with the vendor that is ultimately selected. So what you're suggesting would just be very atypical of our procurement process. But, but here's my problem. Honeywell and everybody else who bid, their prices include water meters. And as I understand it, we don't like the Honeywell water meters, so we're going to be negotiating with Honeywell saying, take water meters out of this contract. We don't want yours. And so if we're going to do that, and maybe I've been misinformed, but if we're going to do that with Honeywell, why don't we do it with the others? So I could ask uh, Dan Montgomery to come up, and in fact, I will. But part of what happened with the Honeywell proposal was it specifically included an alternate for what is known as the iPearl meter, which was very attractive to our staff as part of that. So. Um, I'll ask Dan to come up and speak specifically. Dan was part of the evaluation committee that looked at the thousand items that Councilmember Robertson referenced. So. so, as Mr. Montgomery is making his way forward, the um, recommendation, the highest rated provider was Corn Main. The second highest rated rated was Honeywell. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Dan Montgomery, Water Systems Director. As a mayor, you just mentioned that Corn Main was. They met 96 percent of our criteria. Honeywell met 97%, and the, the other vendors were 77, 90, and below. So that's why we narrowed it down to those two. Mm -hmm. As far as the water meter, we're not saying that the Honeywell water meter wouldn't work. It's just that the, the proposal that the core and main had with the meter they had was like 15 to 20 year life of the meters with the battery change outs, everything about it. and. Uh, the accuracy was much better with the meters that, that were recommended by Corn Main. They gave us an option to opt out if we picked Honeywell, where we could go and negotiate. When we negotiate and propose those, vent, those meters, then we would take a look at all the various meters out there, and we may not pick the, the, the Corn Main one. It could be anybody's meter, but they agreed to give that option to us to allow us to do that. So are you saying the others didn't? The other, the other vendors proposed a specific meter. And right. just this particular company opted to give us an option to, they said you could put anybody's meter you want in there. We're including the installation in the proposal, but if you want to go with a different meter, then you just select whatever meter you want. It gives us an option we don't have with the others. We didn't ask for that. So I'm looking at the best and final offer sheet from 8-2 of 18 on Honeywell. The total combined cost is $30,455,729. Is that not including the water meter? That includes water meters. Okay, so what's the price without the water meter? Well, I'd have to, I don't know if I have that cost with us here. And we could, we ob obviously we could go ahead and use their water meter too. So all this does is gives us an option to bid the water meters separately and everything else is the same in their proposal. We don't even know that we could afford to have the other meter because we don't know that the vendor would supply the meter at that exact cost. So we will have to go out and bid those water meters and find out 
of that we could use any of the five people that supply water meters. It really, we would just have to look at that as an option. Okay, thank you. So, if I may, yes, Dan, oh. am I getting this? <laughs> Is this a just a way to compare and contrast? I mean, if you have the contract, uh, city manager. Yeah. Well, let me make. If I understand. We, we already know what we're going to get with corn main we've, we've negotiated a contract we have terms and provisions and, and and that's very well known to us what a contract with them would look like because we've negotiated that what we don't know is exactly what Dan's described here exactly what a contract with Honeywell would look like we know they've given us the option of pick whatever water meter you want we don't specifically care about that and we know that through our procurement process there was a superior meter out there that we would prefer to get if as dan has mentioned financing uh, the, the, the cost of the project would allow for it but we would have to go and negotiate that specifically with honeywell we'd have to bid to specifically try to see if we could procure the meter that our staff has evaluated as superior for the water portion of a customer's bill and then bring that back to the council with final recommendations we're not in a position tonight to make that recommendation what we're seeking is do you want us to go and negotiate that contract with the mesh provider the top rated mesh provider which is honeywell thank you okay um is there any further discussion on the motion Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council uh, members. Could, could you restate what we're? Uh, it's just the bill, the resolution 18807 that's in front of us as presented. You want to just read it? Can I read it? Yeah. A resolution directing the city manager to negotiate a contract for the purchase and installation of advanced metering infrastructure for the water, water pollution control, and power and light departments. Oh, so it's not just with Honeywell? We already have a negotiated contract with Corn Maine. So right. This would be to negotiate a contract with Honeywell. Just with Honeywell, okay. So that the council can compare those. I got it. I got it. It is a comparison then. Yes. It's it's not saying that we're going we're, to do no, it. No, right. it's not saying oh, that we're going to okay. do it. It's saying that we're going to look at two options. Yeah. And may reject both of them. And may reject both of them. Madam City Clerk. Council Members Huff. No. Perkins. Yes. Doherty. Yes. DeLucy. No. Robertson. No. Van Camp. Yes. Mayor Weir. Yes. Careful. Resolution passes. Okay. That only took an hour. Resolution 18804 um, is pledging support to the Hidden Heroes in Independence, Missouri and the Elizabeth Dole Foundation for the Military and Veteran Caregivers. Um, this is a program that I have recently become familiar with that um, engages cities across the United States um, to lend, to develop and lend support services to those who take care of veterans, whether they be their spouses, their children, their parents, their siblings. Um, I was very impressed with this program when I learned about it at a event that I attended at the Dole Institute in uh, Lawrence, Kansas uh, several weeks ago. And um, since then have become, you know, increasingly aware of the number of veterans that are being cared for in the city of Independence. Um, so um, there's a lot of services that are um, available to these caregivers um, that can be provided by the communities in which they live through a variety of different organizations and resources. Um, Senator Dole appoints two representatives from each state to be the contact people, and so we have two representatives in the state of Missouri who are resources for veteran caregivers. Um, so I would like to move for approval of resolution 18804 and to continue to explore how we can increase these services for veteran caregivers in the city of Independence. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. 
Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mary Weir? Yes. Um, our state manager has a prior commitment this evening that I'm going to let him get to. Um, so before we move on to our regular agenda, uh, Mr. State Manager, if you'd like to introduce Adam Norris and hand the microphone over to him, we'll let you get out of here. Baptism by fire, here's Assistant City Manager Adam Norris, uh, who started last Thursday with us. Welcome aboard, friend. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. I guess we don't have a nameplate for you yet. No, not yet. So we'll just call you city manager. Okay, um, we have four public hearings this evening. Our first is a public hearing for the amendment to the Unified Development Ordinance, Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code relating to short-term rentals in Section 14-200-05-M. This is a full public hearing. Mr. Scannell. Yes, Mayor, members of the council. My name is Tom Scannell. I'm the Community Development Director. Um, this is an item that staff has been working on uh, for over a year now uh, related to short-term rentals. Uh, we formed a uh, staff working group. We met with the Hotel Lodging Alliance and further met with the uh, bed and breakfast operators. Uh, so we gathered all this, this feedback and um, the ordinance that you have before you is is our proposed short-term rental uh, regulations. Um, the amendment includes a definition of what is a short-term rental, uh, has limits has limits on, on the number of guests, uh, has parking requirements, as well as trash collection requirements, uh, as well as some li life safety things um, that need to be included within the dwelling, which includes a map identifying the escape routes, carbon, carbon monoxide detectors, child-proof outlets, uh, emergency contact info for the owner or the manager, fire extinguishers, as well as smoke detectors. Um, the ordinance also outlines uh, the, the process that these types of uses have to go, go through, and uh, that process that we outlined is similar to our home occupation um, process. So that concludes my presentation uh, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, um, I will um, open this up for the public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak in support of this amendment? Is there anybody wishing to speak in opposition? Public hearing is closed. Madam City Clerk. Bill number 18-095, an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code, which will add short-term rental regulations. Second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? Madam Mayor. Mayor. Yes, Council Member DeLucy. I just have one question, Mr. Scannell. I noticed that if there's a problem, um, there's gonna be a hearing in front of the Planning Commission, and then a copy of the transcript would be submitted to the City Council in determining whether or not to revoke the short-term rental license is that so is the evidentiary hearing going to be at the Planning Commission and are we going to just be a review of that hearing or are we going to take actual testimony here I'm just confused because I don't know that much about business <coughs> license revocation I don't know which way it goes and I'm reading that section right now. It's 14-420-06-H. H, H yeah. So it um, states that uh, the license may be revoked by the city council after a hearing before uh, by the planning commission. Right. So the planning commission is gonna hold the hearing, make a recommendation to the city council. And so we would not have any new testimony here? I just don't know if that. And then it goes on and talks about the copy of the transcript of the hearing. So right. it sounds like it's gonna be more or less a new evidence only public hearing before. And is that what is normal when we're looking at a revocation of a license? New evidence only? I seem to remember having hearings, but I really haven't sat through a lot of them, so maybe not. We have a, uh, within the business license section, we have a, a process outlined within, within there as far as, as far as that. Uh, on the home occupation 
section, which is kind of a land use decision. Um, this language here seems to uh, identify that you have the public hearing before the planning commission. That recommendation is forwarded on to the C city council along with the, the tra transcript and the city council would hold a new evidence pu public hearing. And until the council makes a decision, the license stays in effect, right? Or Correct, yes. Okay. I'm just thinking that could be a month or two before the city council actually gets it. Is that typical time frame for business license revocations? If it is, fine. I just think it's sort of a long time. Uh, generally, our, our turnaround on, from planning commission re recommendation onto the city council is uh, a couple weeks. Okay. Um, with the business license um, hearing, uh, those generally take about three to four weeks to get them. So it's comparable? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. Councilmember? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, there's been a lot of work as you stated yeah. done with this and, and a lot of negotiations and, and wording get this right mm -hmm. um, the way our city is, is set up to invite tourists to come and visit and enjoy correct to make sure that everybody's on an even level playing field and also safe when they stay in these establishments so i appreciate your hard work i appreciate charlie's hard work over there mm -hmm. so um i would support uh ad adoption yes. very good is there any further discussion hearing none please call the roll Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Ware? Yes. Ordinance passes. Our next public hearing is an application by the Pit Stop Tavern, LLC, for tavern intoxicating liquor license and Sunday sales license for Barrel and Vine Tavern at 18801 East 39th Street South. This is a full public hearing. Mr. DeSalle. Mayor, members of the council, Charlie DeSalle, Assistant Community Development Director. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a application at 18801 East 39th Street South, which is the Independence Center. Um, this particular location will be at the old Starbucks in the food court. It's a approximately 12 by 24 bar area, uh, about a 300 square foot cordoned off area that will include four to six tables. Very good. Um, is there anybody here wishing to speak in support of this application? Please come forward. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening. Members of Council, I'm Dick Bryant. I uh, represent the uh, applicants in this uh, endeavor. It is interesting to, uh, when you consider the size of this, uh, the, the bar area that's actually proposed is one-fifth the size of this room. Uh, and so we're not talking about a, a, a destination bar. We're not, at, we're not talking about a bar where you'll be sitting around the house one night and going, let's not go on down to the mall. This is a new concept that's coming out in a number of malls throughout the community, uh, which uh, the mall is supportive of, believes it will be a, an enhancement for shoppers coming to the area, and uh, also from experienced operators. And so uh, we have representatives both of the operator, the managing officer who's going to talk a, a little bit about the safeguards, uh, that are in place uh, and the training that's already underway with the state and with the uh, sheriff's department uh, as well as the uh, uh, owner of the operation. So uh, if we could allow them to visit a little bit about that. Sure. I would tell you that the state has uh, been out, examined the site and issued the license on the first. That license was received today. Thank you. Hello, oh, Council. Um, we started this endeavor we're probably about four months into it now. We were originally putting a barrel and vine, um, initially called the Pit Stop Tavern, which is the LLC, in the Oak Park Mall. Uh, and I'm the owner of the Pachugo Gelato and Cafes here in the Kansas City market. We own one in the Oak Park Mall. And we had negotiated with CBL, or they had actually negotiated with us, to open a barrel and vine um, in the Oak Park Mall. The ownership group of the Independence Center approached us that they actually wanted to be first to do this exact same concept um, and asked if we would come sit down with them, which I did, obviously, and determined that after meeting with them, meeting with the ownership group, meeting with the management of the mall and their interest in this endeavor, 
we halted the progress of the talks with CBL, which were almost finalized actually for the Oak Park Mall, and determined that we would proceed with the Independence Center uh, first. In addition to that, we'd also put a Pachuga Gelato in the Independence Center. So we're doing this simultaneously, and to be perfectly frank, I'd like to have a nap. Um, we do have information as you have there in front of you. You see the, uh, the logo for the barrel and vine. And then directly behind that, the second page is a top-down view of what the tavern itself would look like. Um, the bar top would be covered with uh, five different logos. One, well, pictures, if you will, our logo being in the middle. We have uh, partnered with Boulevard Brewery to keep everything as local as possible. Uh, you also have stamps there for both Kansas City, Missouri and Independence, Missouri. The concept behind this is uh, very simplistic. Essentially, if you're thinking like airport bar, uh, open air concept, tavern, as you walk through, there's a few in California. We haven't found any in Missouri. We've not found any in Kansas. Um, I came up here from New Orleans. I can tell you there's none there. Uh, so we wanted to start this endeavor and now we hear this evening to present it to you. Thank Jesse, did you want to talk you. a little bit about our working with Boulevard? So, uh -huh. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for your time this evening. Uh, my name is Jesse. I'm the managing operator for the Barrel and Vine Tavern. Um, what we're looking at, again, is a very simplistic concept. Uh, maximum capacity of this place is probably about 30 people, so not going to have crazy wild parties or anything like that. Uh, we're going to follow the hours of the mall itself, so we will be closed when the mall closes, um, which will be 9 o'clock and then uh, 6 o'clock on Sundays. Um, we have obviously the area is completely stationed off so it's you have to be 21 years old to get even through our little stanchions um, we're gonna have a three drink max rule for every single person because we're not trying to get anybody intoxicated we do have a lot of safeguards in place to make it a fun and safe environment only to work in but to come to um, the market that we're trying to get you know basically pull towards is you know the kind of the daddy daycare kind of thing if you will you know while you're at the mall you know, somebody else is hanging out, the family's taking pictures of Santa, come over, have yourself a nice cocktail, maybe watch a Chiefs game. Um, real kind of low key, again, the local thing is one of the biggest things that we want to go with. We want to use Boulevard. Um, they're going to train our bartenders, they're going to take them down to the brewery so that we not only have the safeguards from, you know, the Sheriff Department standards, but also are going to have, you know, good bartenders, white right bartenders are going to make sure that everybody's safe and having a good time while you're in there. Um, but all in all, again, think airport bar, very simple concept. Just something you can kind of come over, have a drink, and have a decent time. So, do you have any questions about any of the other operational standards that we have in place? Awesome. Thank you for your Thank time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Raylene Trum. I'm the general manager for Independence Center, and we're very supportive. We've worked very closely with Mr. Marshall, and we're really comfortable. And I do have some experience with this concept at a center in California, and it, it works great. It's a great daddy daycare as he mentioned <laughs> so and we will be you know operating within the mall hours and we're very supportive of it thank you we appreciate that yep. um, I'll conclude the public hearing and then we'll have com questions from the council if there are any is there anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application okay the public hearing is closed Madam City clerk Council action is requested on the application received from the Pit Stop Tavern LLC for Tavern Intoxicating Liquor License and Sunday Sales License for Barrel and Vine Tavern at 18801 East 39th Street South. Is there any discussion on this bill? Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman Perkins. Not so much a discussion as just saying that how excited I am, the fact that we have a mall that we can talk about that's bringing new tenants and yeah. different ideas in it. As you read the, the, the papers and see the metro area, there's a lot of malls that have died and or, and or trying to reinvent themselves. So I'm, I'm glad that our independent center is still alive and kicking. So. Very good. Any other discussion? I just think it's a great idea. Yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> Madam City Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Um, our th next public hearing is an application by Evans Field Distillery LLC for manufacturing, distilling, blending of intoxicating liquor and tavern intoxicating liquor and Sunday sales license for Evans Field Distillery. 
at 13621 East 42nd Terrace South. This is a full public hearing. Mr. DeSalf. And this particular license is for an approximately 7,000 square foot building. Um, I think it's currently being finished right now. Uh, this business will produce intoxicating liquor as well as sell by the drink and the package. Um, and it's part of the, their business model um, to be the distillery. So any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Um, I believe we've had a couple of people over there to visit this and been pretty impressed Very impressive. with what Very they're impressive what they're putting together. Um, this is a full public hearing. Is there anyone present who would like to speak in, that, in support of this application? May it please the council. Uh, my, my name is John Whitfield. I am a partner in Evansfield Distillery. My, my other partner, uh, Dennis Evans, is, is here with right me. He's behind you. Um, <laughs> um, Dennis is from Independence. I'm from the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, so we know a little bit about uh, bourbon, but we hope to, to be able to, uh, to develop a new process here in Independence. On August the 8th of this year, we, uh, we were able to obtain a patent from the United States Patent Trademark Office for the acceleration or of, of, of whiskey, uh, and we want to do it here. Uh, we're excited about doing it here, and th one of the benefits of our process is that we will not be using uh, barrels, which is creates a green type process. Essentially, the idea is that we will have a 750 milliliter bottle, which will have a wood medallion in the bottle itself. And so the aging process continues until such time that it's consumed. It's a very novel, revolutionary way of creating uh, whiskey, and uh, we want to do it here. And so we're excited about that, and we're excited about partnering with uh, uh, the City of Independence. Uh, we believe that uh, our, our process will uh, accelerate the already existing tourism that you have here in Independence, and uh, we request, respectfully request uh, uh, acceptance of our application. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do you have anything to add? Okay. No, uh, <laughs> just um, I grew up and uh, graduated from William Christman, and I'm glad to be back in Independence. Uh, also, to open a business here, it's been a lifelong dream to come back to the city and, and do something and, and give back. So I'm really appreciative that you all are hearing us tonight and, and look forward to having you out. It's quite quite the place. If you haven't been there, come by and see it. We've really done a lot with the facility and I think from a tourist perspective we've really set the bar high for anyone else in the Kansas City area that uh, already has a distillery. I think we, we were going to demonstrate that uh, independence is where you need to come if you want to pick out some fine spirits. So Madam it. Mayor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I've been working closely with Mr. Evans and uh, we've been out there and uh, it, since the beginning and uh, I can tell you that this is of the possibilities or the paradigm of being our shark tank. Yeah. This, this is a first class facility with first class recommendations from everybody I've ever heard or seen. And this is not a liquor license to sell, it's a liquor license to explore and see what the future of liquor is going to be. I can't tell you enough how much we appreciate you being here as I have said. I brought out several flags to him, and he's displaying them in his. Mm -hmm. and, and I brought many people out there too to see him, Councilman Huff, and uh, city manager even. And this is really great that you chose here, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anybody present who would like to speak in opposition of this application? Okay, the public hearing is closed. I would say clerk. Council action is requested on the application received from Evansfield Distillery, LLC, for manufacturing, distilling, blending of intoxicating liquor and tavern intoxicating liquor and Sunday sales license for Evansfield Distillery at 13621 East 42nd Terrace South. This application requires a two-thirds majority vote for approval due to residential property being located within 300 feet of the establishment. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Congratulations. Welcome, welcome back. <laughs> um, okay, our final public hearing this evening is an application by Libido's Mexican Restaurant, LLC, 
for a restaurant bar or intoxicating liquor license and Sunday sales license for Libido's Mexican Restaurant at 3421 Blue Ridge Cutoff. This is a full public hearing. Mr. DeSalle. And this application is for an existing restaurant. It's about 35,000 or 3,500 square feet, excuse <laughs> wow, me. That's a big um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, since it's a restaurant bar intoxicating liquor, they do have to have more than 50% of their sales come in from foods. So. Okay, very good. Is there anybody wishing to speak in support of this application? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Madam Mayor. Yes. Uh, I, I'm familiar with this. It's uh, in close proximity to my R house. <laughs> and right. and, and they, had, they had had a liquor license before and lost it, but there was no problems. There was nothing associated with it, and it's a fine establishment and uh, fine people. I'd highly recommend it. Okay, very good. Our public hearing is closed. Madam Sage. Council action is requested on the application received from Libido's Mexican Restaurant LLC for a restaurant bar intoxicating liquor and Sunday sales license for Libido's Mexican Restaurant located at 3421 South Blue Ridge Cutoff. Is there any discussion on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Bingham? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. Oh, we're really rocking in the fourth district tonight. <laughs> uh, and it's not half of it. Yeah, more to come. <laughs> There's um, much more there. We have um, one non ordinance action item this evening. Um, Madam City Clerk. Council actions requested to approve the purchase of specific and aggregate stop loss insurance from Cigna for the Staywell Health Care Program for the 2019 plan year mm -hmm. in the amount of $1,273,870. Is there any discussion on this item? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Item passes. We have uh, one um, second reading this evening. Bill number 18-096, an ordinance authorizing execution of a municipal and cost apportionment agreement between the Missouri Highways and Transportation Commission for the US 24 Highway Bridge Replacement Public Improvements Project. Second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? Oh, I have a few questions, Madam yes. Mayor. Uh -huh. What are the enhancements? I mean, it, it never tells me what our money's going for. Is it, do we know <laughs> what the enhancements are? Well, we just had a, a, a brief design meeting uh, last Friday, uh, and so those are those are concepts are being developed and discussed right now. So that's yet to be determined. Okay, and so we know for a fact it won't be more than the requested funding in this ordinance, but we're just not sure how we're going to be spending it. Is that, that right? That's correct. Uh, we anticipate it being less than this amount, certainly. Okay, and then it also authorizes the city manager to pursue debt financing alternatives to be repaid from the street sales tax funds. We're not quite sure then how we're gonna repay or pay this million dollars. I might ask Brian to come up. If you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> if we know. Uh, good evening, Brian Kidney, the finance director. Um, I had them put that language in there. There was a couple different things that were talked about. Um, what I really want to wait for is to see what the actual dollar amount is okay. um, before we start any kind of uh, debt funding plan on this. I mean, if it's at the low end, we might be able to cash fund it out of the sales tax fund. Um, if it's on the high end, we would um, probably look at going through the um, development authority. Um, and do some sort of a bond, <clears throat> sorry, bond issue. To and if we did the bond issue, the financing, the payment of the bond would come from the street sales tax? That would be our, our intent. Okay. Yes. And if, if it comes to pass that that won't work, does this come back to this body? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah, that's all we're doing is just making sure that gets out there. And uh, that second part of the authorization is just to ask us to come up with different ways to finance this but we didn't want to stop the process because Got we it. won't know what the amount is until they're done with the, the initial design. But we'll see it. Okay, yeah. thank you, Mr. Yeah. Kidney. Is there, any, is there any other discussion on this bill? Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman. If I may, just, just a quick recap on, on how we've reached this point. When I started the uh, 24 Highway Initiative, 
several years ago as it was moving through and uh, Dr. Graham from the Truman Library reached out and discussed what can we do. I think we've had some study sessions about what are we going to do with the bridge and, and some different things there. Ultimately, we decided that the bridge should stay. Um, we reached out and, and spoke with MoDOT. MoDOT was going to replace this bridge at some time and uh, we've asked them to maybe move that time frame to be more conducive to the Truman Library grand reopening in, in April of 2020. Instead of having just a good old fashioned MoDOT bridge, and we've all seen how ugly they can be, but they're very effective and no offense to our MoDOT friends. Um, the Truman Library, the McCoy Park in the McCoy neighborhood deserves something better than that. Okay. And more of something that, um, that brings some, some refreshing life to that area. A statement. A statement. Well, Got I'll it. put my attorney friend colleague. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of where we're moving. We had our first meeting last week to discuss designs and, and, and thoughts and it's a community involvement. Um, so we're excited to get to this step and, and move forward with it. Great. Um, I just want to say a thank you to Councilman uh, Perkins for really taking a leadership role in this and making sure that we end up with something that is fitting for our presidential library right here in Independence, Missouri. It was a great meeting on Friday. It was four o'clock on Friday afternoon, <laughs> but so but the energy was high and I was incredibly impressed with the level of creativity that MoDOT brought and um, HNTB and the citizens who we have asked to participate in helping us think through this. They really, um, I, you know, really came forward with a lot of great visions with input from the committee um, on, on some really spectacular enhancements that we can make in this area that will not only benefit those, the visitors to the Truman Library, but really the neighborhood that um, is near and, and around McCoy Park and making that a, a, a even better amenity for that neighborhood and everybody in our community who accesses that park. So thank you very much for that. Mayor, if I can carry on just a little bit. It was nice just to have uh, Senator Bond was also uh, in town. So he Blunt. was Blunt. Blunt. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Senator Blunt was this in is town. 2018. Thank you <laughs> for the fast forward there. Yeah. But he was in town, stuck his head in the door, and the mayor was able to speak to him. But he can also go back to Washington and see how serious we are about trying to make things uh, better and improve independence. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. This takes us to our first readings. These next bills will receive their first reading and their second reading and considered by the council at the next scheduled meeting. Bill number 18-097, an ordinance authorizing a contract to the VF Anderson Builders LLC in the amount of $712,100 for the installation of pipe and water main on 23rd Street from Hayden Street to west of Trail Ridge and authorizing future minor change orders not to exceed $71,210 and or time extensions. Bill number 18-098, an ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Eric Shiners to purchase the former water department building. Bill number 18-099, an ordinance amending chapter three of the independent city code establishing standards for the keeping of beehives in the city limits. Bill number 18-100, an ordinance amending the zoning district map as to attractive ground located at 119 North Wilson Avenue from District R12 to Family Residential to, to I1 Industrial in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. Bill number 18-101, an ordinance amending Chapter 14 of the Independent City Code pertaining to beekeeping by increasing the number of zoning districts where hives are allowed and also regulating the possible number of beehives on such properties. Bill number 18-0, or excuse me, 18-102, an ordinance approving a special use permit to operate a vehicle sales business at 3114 South Weatherford Road in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. Bill number 18-103, an ordinance approving the final plot of Stone Canyon, second plot in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri. Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilmember DeLucy. I do have a few questions on this one. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I jumped the gun, go ahead. <laughs> Bill number 18-104. Yep. An ordinance. <laughs> do you want me to read it first? An ordinance authorizing and directing the city manager to execute a development agreement with DD Residential Development LLC. Here's my question. I have something too. 
We're doing a temporary second access, but it doesn't say how temporary temporary is. And I noticed it's an 18 foot access. A usual road is 26 feet. And I know that they're doing it because the access road is gonna be over the landfill. But I would like to know how temporary is temporary. Are we talking two years? Are we talking two months? I have no idea if anybody knows. Mayor, members of the council, Tom Scannell, Community Development Director. Uh, as we were negotiating this, we had uh, several different departments involved with reviewing this, uh, the fire department as well as the public works department as well as uh, the developer. And as far as the temporary, um, you're right, the development agreement does not spell out how, how long temporary is. One of the things that, that we were um, working towards is having this developer continue to develop out the subdivision as he works with uh, other landowners as well as uh, land trust and Missouri Department of uh, Natural Re Resources to make that road a more permanent road. And the developer is, is here and, and maybe he could speak a little more about that as well. Hello again, guys. Hello. Kevin Stallings, D&D uh, &D Development. Um, that's a tricky question to, to answer how long it's gonna be. When I got here, I attempted to try to help repair the CID that's on this particular piece of ground. And uh, me and my attorney, Jack Manoli, spent uh, about nine months trying to put that together. And at the end of the day, it was not fixable. Our only choice that is for certain is in 2027, the CID will expire. And at that point in 2028, I can continue on with phase three and phase four in the development there. Yeah. Until the CID is either fixed or they figure out how to give more than a two year forbearance, I can't pull financing from a bank to actually do the development. So I need a five year forbearance. That's the lowest I can get from any bank that'll actually do the financing to do the lots. So I know in 2028, and I just turned 50, so I hope I'm gonna be around that long. I'm gonna finish doing phase three and phase four. Um, I am currently have and met with uh, Ross Miller, who is a gentleman that owns the land between I-70 and the golf course, 89 acres exactly. Uh, there is residential, uh, entry residential, and maybe light industrial, possibly multifamily that could be in there. Uh, but his wife fell ill about a month ago, and so I'm giving the family some time and some space while he takes care of his wife. Okay. So. They approached me, so I figured they'll be back as soon as, you know, mom was feeling better and, and we can start talking about that again. That would be my next part to go to, hopefully in the next year, I would love to start that. But I can't give you a guarantee because I don't have one. I just don't want to see you transfer the property, you know, over to Homeowners Association with that temporary road in. That's that's my fear. And I don't know you and I'm not I'm not you know, making any judgment. I, I am just concerned that if we leave this just unsaid, you transfer it to a homeowners association, we don't have that second access ever because a homeowners association isn't going to do anything. And I see your lawyers dying to talk. <laughs> Hi, Jackie Maloney, attorney with Real Law. Um, okay, so the temporary access as planned and put in the development agreement is over the golf course and that will be a, an easement in favor of the city and um, d and residential development so even if uh, this is not going to be included as part of the HOA um, it is going to be a permanent easement uh, that the HOA is not going to have any control over whatsoever the only um, temporary part is that we can't have a paved surface over the landfill at this point. Um, mm -hmm. We have talked to MDNR about um, doing that in the future. We've got several other environmental issues out there um, that need to be addressed before we can make that a permanent roadway. Um, and what he was, uh, what Kevin was discussing with respect to the Ross Miller land, that could provide a, an alternative 
permanent access off of the outer road, but negotiations have stalled and um, we've got these eight lots that were just approved um, in, in the prior uh, reading and um, to get the remaining six lots in the first plat and then the eight um, in the second plat, we have to have some sort of access and this is um, the best we can do for right now. Thank you. Thank you. The mayor? Yes. So is this a, this temporary road, is this gravel? Yes, it will be gravel 18 feet wide um, and the turning radiuses we have discussed with the fire department um, and it will be uh, maintained snow removal. So it's not that big of a deal um, as relates to the golf course because it's already a maintenance road that's already being maintained mm -hmm. throughout the, the golf course. So no curbs? There's, oh. There are no curbs, but it will be exclusively used for um, golf courts uh, golf carts for the golf course and the fire access and there will be a gate and a um, some, uh, some sort of sensor um, that we discussed with um, the fire department uh, that allows the only fire department to get through that gate okay. and it'll be engineered for 80,000 pounds which will handle any uh, fire truck that they have so will there be this is behind some of the housing division right no. Some of the houses? This no. comes straight through the golf course okay. and connects to the end of Stone Canyon Drive. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Clerk. Bill number 18-105, an ordinance vacating a portion of the sanitary sewer easement near Little Blue Parkway and East 42nd Street South. Bill number 18-106, an ordinance authorizing the annual contract with Mid-America Regional Council for a maximum reimbursement of $59,750 in grant funding for the city's senior adult nutrition site program for fiscal year 2018-2019, making the necessary appropriations, authorizing future change orders for additional funding and or time extensions, and authorizing certain future appropriations. Bill number 18-107, an ordinance amending section 3.01.007 of the Independent City Code to align the city code with state statute regarding holding times for impounded animals. Bill number 18-108, an ordinance amending section 3.03.009 of the Independent City Code requiring dogs classified as vicious to be microchipped and sterilized before being removed from the city. Bill number 18-109, an ordinance amending various sections of Article 7 Electrical Code of Chapter 4 of the Independent City Code and adopting the 2017 edition of the National Electric Code. The next bill is being read as an emergency. It will be read twice and be considered by the Council. Bill number 18-508, an ordinance approving a final plat for Voorhees Vale PUD 14th plat lots Q6, Q6-L, Q6-R at 12709, 12711 East 40, 40th Terrace Court South in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri in declaring an emergency. Bill number 18-508, an ordinance approving a final plat of Voorhees Vale PUD 14th plat lots Q6, Q6-L, Q6-R at 12709 and 127. 1 1 East 47th Terrace Court South in Independence, Jackson County, Missouri, in declaring an emergency, second and final reading. Is there any discussion on this bill? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Members Huff? Yes. Perkins? Yes. Doherty? Yes. DeLucy? Yes. Robertson? Yes. Van Camp? Yes. Mayor Weir? Yes. Ordinance passes. This takes us to Council Member Commons. I'll start on my left with Council Member Van Camp. Yes, Madam Mayor. Uh, today at Rockwood, the northern buildings were demolished. Yeah. This is a continuation of the city's uh, commitment to making and keeping our pledge to make it a wonderful place to be. And we will we, we go forward on it and keep that going. Okay, thank you. Councilman Robertson. I just wanted to thank the uh, Chamber of Commerce for the enjoyable Halloween parade. It was uh, nice weather. I was up there close to the announcer and was able to hear and see most of the floats as they went by. So thank you to all that participated. I know the kids enjoyed all the candy <laughs> that was thrown out. Good day for dentists. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member DeLucy. I would just like to mention this coming Saturday at the new farmer's market here, there is going to be a fundraiser 
It's being put on by the Jackson County Historical Society and is a fundraiser for the Pioneer Spring Cabin. Um, and I encourage everybody to go. It's at seven o'clock, I believe, and the tickets are $25. You can sign up online or you could just show up at seven o'clock and enjoy very good music. Thank very you. Good. Thank you. Councilman Doherty. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, last Friday, I attended uh, a luncheon over with the chamber at the new farmers market. We had the governor in, of course, you were there too. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had very high compliments of how nice that facility looked. It worked out really great. It held a, a perfect crowd, and it uh, was really nice to have a nice place that we could uh, host our governor as he spoke about infrastructure and, and uh, workforce development. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Perkins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to uh, say thanks. This is the last meeting that our Assistant Community Development Director is going to be at Charlie's sure. Estelle. He is no longer going to be with us at the end of the week, but I want to personally say thanks. That it's been a delight working with you, bouncing down in your office and, and talking to you about different issues. So thank you for your open door and your patience with me and sometimes frustrations. So good <laughs> luck with, with whatever you got going on and, and thank you for all you did over here. Thank you, Charles. Councilman Mahal. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that Gee Hall closed on Wednesday, so we now have a, uh, the armed forces will be up there, uh, the trucking backed out, so but we're trying to find somebody else up there to take the rest of that building on. Very good. Thank you. Um, Charlie, we will miss you. Thank you for all you've done, and you've made, you know, sometimes a very complex job go so smoothly, and we really, really appreciate it, and the expediency in which you get things done. Um, we often get calls um, or in discussions with developers, um, business owners looking for the different permitting processes, and um, we all know in our business that everybody likes to say, you know, your city's the worst and somebody else is the best <laughs> or, or whatever, but um, <coughs> we continually get incredibly high praise for the companies that we work with about our permitting process that I know you work so closely with, with uh, Mr. Scannell, and uh, it's really a source of pride for us that we're able to have such great customer service and working with those businesses and expanding and, and coming to independence. Um, I also just wanted to say thank you to the Chamber of Commerce for inviting Governor Parson to independence on Friday. Um, the Chamber has, I'm certain every year they extend a, um, a invitation to the governor to come and speak with the community. And in my, certainly on my seven years with this, on this council and, and the, in my memory, we've never had the governor in town for a Chamber of Commerce event. So um, that's a tremendous compliment to the, to our chamber and what they're doing to reach out and certainly to our governor for understanding the importance of getting out into these communities. He talked you know, a lot about um, workforce development, a lot about our infrastructure needs in the state and in our cities and counties. We have an opportunity tomorrow, um, if you haven't voted already, which I know many people have voted early, um, to please you know, make sure that you get out and vote tomorrow. Um, Prop D is on the ballot, which the governor spoke about extensively. Um, and the, the wording, um, thanks to legislative and legal minds, is very confusing. But um, the upshot of Prop D is that it will add funding to our state road system and to our local roads systems as well. So when we're talking about how we're going to fund the 24 Highway Bridge, if we are successful in passing Prop D, that will give us another revenue source to do those kinds of projects. So I encourage people to look at that and the other hundreds of things that are on the ballot tomorrow. Um, one announcement that um, we're very proud of is, once again, the City of Independence has received the Digital Cities Award. I will be attending the National League of Cities Conference um, later this week. and. One of the things I'll be doing there is bringing home that award. Our tech services uh, department applies for this every year, and we have been awarded it 15 out of the last 16 years in um, cities of our size. 
which I believe is a record. I, you know, little old Independence, Missouri tends to do very well in this category. So we're still looking for that number one uh, top prize, but we have been in the top 10 for cities of our size nationwide for um, digital advancements 15 out of the last 16 years. So very proud of that. Uh, Mr. City Manager, anything else this evening? Yeah, thank you. I'd hate to mess up my first meeting here and, and uh, miss something. Um, Council Member Huff requested a study session presentation on the IPO fuel cost adjustment, and that presentation has been scheduled for uh, November 26th. Okay. Okay. And uh, personally, just uh, excited to be uh, joining this organization and uh, being a part of this great team of professional staff, and uh, look forward to getting to know you all and working with you all. Thank you. Welcome. We're glad to have you here. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.